It's November 22, 2008. It's Maximize Utility. Today I want to start a series on behavioral economics. Now this is a sprawling area and it would take a lot to define it quite correctly, but in general it's applying psychology to the basic micro ideas of economics and then kind of relaxing the ideas of rationality and self-interest. And the basic question I want to get at is, is this a really cool area with lots of good research being done, uh, coming up with important results? Or is it an area that's completely picked through and really hasn't produced any kind of usable results? But what I really believe to be true is that it's a very dastardly area. It's a very unethical line of research and that it's being done by the most emasculated people in academia and being picked up by the same in the press. Behavioral economists try to make the case that people are irrational. That is, that they're stupid, that they can't make basic decisions and they make consistent mistakes. And in the uh, business of behavioral economics, there are certain stories here over and over again. They're done in classrooms, and you read about them in the press. And let's go through six of these and see how truly compelling they are. The six are the selling of the dollar, the selling of the jar of coins, the lost ticket, the tie versus the car, the let's make a deal story, and the disease probability story. Selling the dollar. This one is attributed to economist Martin Schubeck a 1982 book, Game Theory and Social Sciences, but it's been very, very popular in college classes ever since. And dollar is auctioned with two conditions. The highest bidder gets a dollar, and the second highest bidder pays the amount he or she bid. Now, the bidding could degenerate into an internecine signed patent. So something like this. You bid 90 cents, I bid 95. Then you bid a dollar, and then I bid over a dollar to avoid losing the 95. Now, supposedly, professors have done this, and they've got the kids to bid the price of the dollar way up to around $3. That I find very hard to believe. I've done it myself in my classes at Tufts University, and the bidding usually stops around a dollar, too. And in general, I notice a lot of students won't even partake in it. But those who do, they really are just kind of tricked into doing it in the first place. So my conclusion on this selling the dollar, it's not going to work in multiple cases, for example. I think it's altogether unconvincing. I think it's also stupid and offensive. It really just relies on tricking people. Selling the jar of coins, this is another very popular... BE game played in many classrooms, apparently. It goes back to a paper by a big name behavioral economist Richard Thaler, The Winner's Curse, a general economic perspectives, winter of 1998. And here he brings a, a jar full of coins into a class, and he has students bid on the, uh, the jar, and their bids are sealed. They don't know what the other people are bidding. And the idea is that somebody on average, they might be bidding right, but somebody's probably going to get it wrong, and he's the one who's going to win it. And so Thaler claims that you'll get about $10 for about $8 worth of coins. I don't know if it's true or not. I've never done it myself in any class. But my guess is it would only work once if you did it. Uh, I think in these classroom simulations, generally the students don't really care. They don't really care if they pay $10 for an $8 uh, jar of coins anyway. But where people do care about whether they're going to overpay, they make a point not to be suckered like this. And so in, say, a property auction or a car auction, it's not a sealed bid type of auction. In an auction that is sealed bid, like some auctions for U.S. government securities, the participants know what they're doing, and they don't generally suffer from the win winner's curse. So my conclusion is this is a very unconvincing story also. Again, in the real world, you simply wouldn't partake in a sealed bid auction unless you could handle it. The lost ticket. Here we're told a person shows up for a ticketed event, and he finds he has lost his $10 ticket. Another person shows up for an event and found he has lost $10. Now, these people should be equally well off. But supposedly, the first person will go home reluctant to buy another ticket. He won't make himself like the second person, take a $10 bill out of his wallet. So the question is, why doesn't he do that? Now, this is supposedly true according to surveys of the event happening hypothetically. Uh, is it valid? I don't know if it's generally valid in real cases. It may be valid in the hypothetical case, but then again, those are just opinions of people, not real actions. And again, it wouldn't happen frequently if we were prone to lose tickets over and over again. We'd finally learn that buying the ticket anew was uh, no worse than losing a $10 bill. My conclusion on this, uh, very unconvincing, and I say it's kind of trivial, too. The tie versus the car and varieties of this. You see a necktie for $25, but you know you can buy it down the street for $20, so you make the effort to save the $5. Now, later on, you're buying a car, and you've negotiated a price of $25,000, and you know, and I put the no in quotes, that you could get it for $24,500 if you go to another dealer down the street or something like that. But you don't make that effort. Now, the grossness of the overall amount has tricked you. You don't want to save the money. Now, supposedly, this is a very, very irrational thing. 
Uh, tie versus car, I said ridiculous. The situation is not that simple. When you buy a car, you usually have a certain model in mind that you want. And there may only be one or two or three or a handful of dealers in town that even carry that model. For example, if you're buying a BMW in the Boston area, there are only a few BMW dealers. And I think they're all related. So you simply can't walk across the street and save $5 or even $500. If you could, you certainly would. If you were negotiating a car price and across the street a guy was waving a sign saying, come over here and I'll save you $5, and you didn't have to spend another hour doing paperwork or whatever, you certainly would do it, but you simply can't do that. Again, my conclusion, this is very, very, very unconvincing. I call it the let's make a deal story. It's really a story about picking after elimination. And it goes back to a game show from the 1960s and 1970s called Let's Make a Deal. In the show, at the last contest, uh, a person would pick one of three doors. And behind one of the doors was a vastly superior prize. After a person would pick, the game show host, Monty Hall, he would open another one of the doors and show that there was nothing there. And then it, there would be two doors that would remain, and Monty Hall would offer to the person to change his choice. Now, people typically would not change, according to some recollections anyway. Now, this is supposedly irrational because changing would be the better strategy, according to statisticians and mathematicians and so on. Now, this uh, perverse behavior has been supposedly seen in other game shows that are similar to Let's Make a Deal. I'm not too sure about those. But, first of all, on the Let's Make a Deal story, the historical situation is not that clear. The uh, recollections are not altogether perfect. But it doesn't matter. Certainly on the Let's Make a Deal show, you knew that the... Uh, game show host Monty Hall was gaming you all along so it didn't really matter which door you picked and I don't know about the other examples from uh, later day games but these are indeed games and people's goals are varied my conclusion is that this is mostly unconvincing the disease probability test this one I believe started in the 1980s and it was intended to demonstrate how stupid people were about probabilities in particular about probabilities of getting certain uh, diseases in particular AIDS now, then it got picked up later, I contend, in the 1990s and thereafter to show how generally irrational and stupid people could be and therefore bigoted. It's uh, complicated. It goes something like this. You're told you have been tested for some ailment. And then what is the chance you truly have that ailment if the test is 95% accurate and if the ailment affects 5% of the population? Now, most people say 95%. That's obviously not the case. But they're stupid and they say that. The correct answer is about 50% or 50% depending on certain assumptions. The reasoning is something like this, for those of you who need to know. Assume a 1,000 people are in the population and I've tested. 50 should have the disease and 950 should not. Of the 950 without the disease, about 47 or 48 will come up with the false positive. Of the 50 with the disease, 2 or 3 will come up with the false negative. So there will result about 95 positives, about half of whom are false positives. So what is wrong with this? Uh, it's just simply way, way too hard to expect people to get. I don't know why people were ever asked it. I know they were. I, in particular, was asked. I remember saying to myself, I'm not going to get this right. If I could go over to the library and have 20 minutes alone to myself, maybe I could figure it out. And I think it was used to show that people are stupid and bigoted. And my conclusion is this is very, very, very unconvincing. And this is definitely on the border of ethics. So those are some of the more common pieces of evidence for behavioral economics. Uh, I guess the economists who do them think they're very clever and very compelling. I find them to be mostly tricks, uh, things that take people by surprise, things that couldn't be repeated. I also think some of them are very mean-spirited. I would admonish people to be careful before they apply to do this kind of behavioral economics research.